morning. It is 10.07. Once again, um, I apologize for the delay in starting um, this meeting and working through the technology. I, as you can see, I am not um, attending a meeting in person uh, due to some family issues. I've already shared with staff, I may have to log off about 30 minutes um, at the top of this meeting at some point and um, may resume back on. It, it just all depends on family and health first, right? Um, so I hope everyone is having a great morning. Um, again, 10.07, calling the meeting to order. If Madam um, Susan Hospital. Good please. morning. Okay, um, Aspira, Florida. IET in action. Black Chamber of Commerce of Palm Beach County. Coalition for Black Student Achievement, Myra Levy Baysmore. Card at FAU, Robin Jones. Here. Card at FAU, Carrie Whittle. Present online. Compass, Amanda Canetti. Present. Compass, Rex Barnes. Division of Blind Services. District ESC Advisory Committee, Carla Donaldson. District ESC Advisory Committee, Kimberly Spiro. Present. Economic Council of Palm Beach County, Craig McKenzie. Present online. El Sol, Jupiter's Neighborhood. <clears throat> um, I, I talked to El Sol, to Josan Cordero, and she said she can't come today, but they're going to send someone next, next meeting. Can we just do a roll call and we'll discuss um, uh, the, the comments um, at okay. the Unfinished Business Policy 1.2. Okay. Thank Florida you. Hispanic American Chamber of Commerce, Juan. <laughs> um, Florida Hispanic American Chamber of Commerce, Evelyn Vargas. Sick. For the children, Reggie Durandis. Here. Gold Coast Down Syndrome Organization, Sue Davis Killian. Guatemalan Mayan Center. We have the, we'll talk about that. There, okay. there come a substitute's going. Okay. And Haitian American Solidarity Center. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce of Palm Beach County, Maria Antunia. His, um, Hispanic Education Coalition, Dr. Gabriela Mendez. Present online. Thank you. And Palm Beach Council of PTAs, Cassandra Corbin Thaddeus. Palm Beach Council of PTAs, Charmaine Postal. Present online. Palm Beach County Human Rights Council, Emmy Kinney. Present. Tri City Education Committee, Mary Evans. Tri City Education, Eddie Rhodes. Urban League of Palm Beach County, Latoya Stevenson. West Palm Beach Chamber of the NAACP, Marsha Guthrie. And West Palm Beach Chapter of NAACP, Rachel Mendesir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Did we miss anybody? Susan, can you please go back to, there's a name that you called, you said Florida Hispanic? Uh, that would be Mr. Pagan. They've had a name change. Okay, so what was the name of the company? What what was the name, Florida? Miss Florida Hispanic American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, okay. But it, it was port, the Florida Puerto Rican. Puerto Rican Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Okay, so that's changed from Puerto Rican Hispanic Chamber of Commerce for Palm Beach County? That would be Palm Beach County and the state of Florida. That was fine. Yes, the state of uh, Palm Beach County. 
I'm just asking, in for the policy state, it's Puerto Rican Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, it's one of the things we're going to have to note. Right, for, we're going to have to make that change. So that's what I'm asking. I'm just getting clarification. So right now, that the we have to continue to call it for what it okay. is, Puerto Rican Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And so that's got a name change, and it's going to be, and we can discuss that for the policy change. But that's what it is in policy. Okay, is, thank you. You're welcome. And I feel like there was another one, but okay. Thank you. We do have a quorum. Thank you. Approval of April minutes. So move. Any discussions? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? April minutes are approved as presented. Um, public comments, are there any public comments that comes before us today? None in the room here, um, but we do, looks like we have someone to, maybe online. Okay, at this time, um, would there, anyone who's in public have anything to say that's online? Care to say anything? No, just, just one here. Thank you, moving right on to update from Chief, uh, um, Chief of Equity and Wellness Report. And good morning, everyone. Happy, uh, happy May. So we're uh, busy in the graduation mode right now. Um, only because I know how sometimes we kind of get caught up. If it's all right that we go to the unfinished business, to the policy review, just to ensure that we take the time to go through that, because I know that was a Big discussion to make sure we get into that, if that's all right. Yes, the chair, uh, to, to start really reviewing yeah, this policy, because if we're going to make progress, that does take some time for policy changes. Okay, any objections at this time to move from the subcommittee um, meeting? None. Here, no. here are no objections. Because we have that time frame for the public comment, I'm just going to pause um, and see that there is someone who's joined us um, who name is I'm not familiar with. Um, at this time, uh, this is the opportunity to have a public comment uh, to the individual who have joined us. Um, are you interested in making a public comment or are you part of the public? I believe you're referring to me. My name is um, Mariana Blanco. I'm from the Guatemala Center. I just uh, became a part of this, of this board. So she's not an uh, official voting member. It will be going to the board June 15th. So, Mariana, thank you and welcome um, for being here. So she'll be uh, board approved at the June board meeting. Welcome, Mariana. Thank you. Um, Tracy. Keith, you can go ahead and continue um, with the policy. Oh, well. That's policy 1.0971. Um, Susan, at this time, have you, or as of today, this morning, have you received any updates for policy 1.0971? No one has emailed. Our no. One no. Um, so and I, I certainly have not emailed, but I did want to point out only one area of the policy that um, I just wanted to see how we could um, implement the um, current policy that we, was approved by the board. Yeah, and before you go into that, um, I just want to talk about just briefly, and we do have our legal representation here, Yolanda Morgan, so thank you for being here. Um, so to keep us honest, um, so just jump in any time, that's your role. But so just so you understand the life cycle of a, a change in policy, so as this is an existing policy, how this how that particularly works is um, we first, um, with a policy change, we do a workshop for the board um, around recommended changes to a policy. Um, so if we do make any changes, we would know they have to meet, and before we even do that, we have to make sure it meets legal sufficiency. So Ms. Morgan would review that with her team to ensure we're in compliance. We would workshop it with the board. Then it has to go um, be publicly advertised 
um, for, I think it's 20 days, um, and then goes to the board after that 20 days for development, um, and then that can also bring any public comment um, from the public at that meeting, and then it, if there's no changes at development, um, or if there are changes, either way, um, it gets advertised again for another 30 days, or 20, 20 again, 20 days, and um, then it goes for adoption, whatever, after 20 days, whatever following meeting, for adoption. So over that span, it does take a couple months, two to three months, so I just want everybody to understand how that process works. So it's not something, okay, we say this, and we can take it to the board next meeting, and it's done. So just understand it takes a little bit of a time to get that done. And this particular policy actually calls out specific organizations. Um, so just understand that as well. So I'm sorry, Ms. Postal. I just want to make sure everybody understood that part. Yes, um, thank you. We have a question in the room. I'll take the question. Is your mic on? Your mic, you have to turn on the mic. Your green light. Oh, there I go. There I go. Um, so are we just reviewing the policy for the composition and appointments at this point? Are we, or is there a, a deeper policy review that we're undertaking this morning? What we discussed last time is both so but the, the bigger discussion was around representation around representation that's what i thought and okay. if there were missing gaps yeah all right very good thank you um if we can please just share our names because if i know that was miss guthrie but i had her mark absent on my end um just so that i because i can't hear what's i barely rarely can hear what's going on in the room um, being online. So I feel you're I'm paying people who's usually online. I'm sorry, Ms. Postella. It looks like when I had said, yes, I'm present, that my mic wasn't on. So I just figured out how to turn it on. No worries. Um, uh, Mr. Oswald, do you want to leave this particular area of the 1.0971? Um, are we taking recommendations since so, no one well, has su submitted anything in writing? Are we... So let's, yeah, I think maybe first where we talk about, um, so I think we should talk about the, first about the organizations that have not been in attendance, because um, per policy, you know, we could do one last reach out to see if they're going to send someone. Otherwise, what I would recommend is that they be dismissed if they're not going to send anybody, and then potentially look to see if it needs to someone needs to um, another organization that we want to recommend to be added to the board so okay. so go into the um, agencies and I'll go in the order and and if someone have heard from them or have um, had um, any input from them I'll start with the vacant agencies then I'll go to the agencies that are not in attendance so as fair of Palm Beach County have anyone heard from them and from my understanding, has, has um, Aspera of Palm Beach County is a Hispanic-based organization? To my knowledge, they closed. Okay. Hispanic. And that's, that was my understanding, too. And then let me just check my email real quick, because all of a sudden, I thought I got an email. Right. Hearing some else. While we are waiting on that, no, um, no, I wasn't. So, okay, um, I see in is question. Um, from my last understanding, Dr. Blamad represented um, IT on his question. I'm saying this wrong. And Dr. Blamad had submitted for a gentleman to serve. He came on maybe a handful of times, and he um, he stopped coming. I don't remember the gentleman's name, but maybe we can reach back out to him. But I do remember he might have his contact information. Susan, is that the last contact you have for IT on this question? Yeah, it was Samuel from Haitian Heroes. I will reach out to him and see if he, if he has the time to serve. To serve. Cause we, IT and I to merge with them as one agency. What is it called? What was the agency called? Haitian Heroes. Haitian Heroes, okay. So, um, 
we can make note that Reginald will reach out to them. So, and then, but you're saying, so Reggie, are you saying IT on Acción is still in operating? No, we merged. merged. We're not operating anymore. Merged. Merged. Oh, uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So they could possibly Haitian heroes. Thank you. Is Haitian heroes the official? No, that's official? Samuel. Say again. Samuel. Can you spell that or type it in the chat? Yeah, I'll, I'll type it for you. Okay, Thank so you. IT is because y'all have dissolved. Exactly. Okay. Has dissolved. And there, um, it is possibly now Haitian Heroes. Um, Black Chambers of Commerce of Palm Beach. I just want to, so that we can take some action. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Go ahead. It's just, so, Reggie, so after you reach out, if you can also send us the contact, because if they are going to submit a name, if they're not going to participate, um, then we need to look at potentially either getting another organization that supports the Haitian community, um, or so we could dissolve this, but so, and we can also reach out after you talk, okay? I will, I will. Great. Okay, um, going on to, uh, what is this? Um, Black Chamber of Commerce of Palm Beach County. I did speak to, um, yesterday I spoke to the chair and president at Black Chambers of Commerce. Um, he is aware and will um, address the concern. I spoke also to the educational leader or educational chair there yesterday at their breakfast. Um, so the Black Chamber of Commerce will have um, some correction um, and send someone there um, on that. There, we so, did have some serving who was consistent and active and um, the district that the person, Dr. Sanchez or Mr. Sanchez, who have now um, since been employed with the district is no longer um, eligible to serve as the voice. Um, but they are, they, their board meeting is this weekend or this week, I think Friday or tomorrow. Friday. So they're going to submit a name change. And they will submit a name to us for that. Okay. And then. Um, just as uh, Mariana, Mariano just did, uh, Mariana just did. We they'll have to submit, you know, a few the work with the board office so we can take the name to the board. So great. great. Can can we just go back for a second? I see Dr. Robinson's on. Um, Dr. Robinson um, on Coalition of Black Student Achievement. If if you could reach out to them to see if they, you know, I know. Ms. Keith, can we continue to go through the vacant agencies first? We're going to get to the Oh, agencies. you're going to vacant first. Okay, yeah. not necessarily attendance. Sorry, you yeah. did say that. Okay. Um, so, as there are, but the question is, um, each agency should have an alternate. The, to answer your question, Dr. Robinson, um, it's in policy that they can have an, uh, an alternate, and some do. So going to Elso Jupiter Neighborhood Resource Center. Have anyone heard from Elso Jupiter? Do anyone Dr. Want? Mendez is raising her hand. Dr. Mendez, if you're talking, I'm mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm having problems with my computer. I'm here like three times, sorry. <laughs> uh, I did talk to Suzanne Cordero and she says they will have one person and an alternative. So next time they will start coming. Okay. They definitely want to participate. She's just been like with too much work and she couldn't come. She's getting a new staff and one of them is going to participate. So they're gonna, she's still gonna attend Dr. Mendez or she's gonna submit an alternative to attend? Uh, she's going to submit an alternative and they may take turns or she may participate online. All right. So after you talk to them, if you could, again, um, reach out to myself and Ms. Susan Holzclaw so that we can get that name, so we can submit the alternative name to the board as well. Yes, I'll do that. And she also asked if we're doing our voice the third Thursday, because in her calendar for next month is the 
24th, which is not the 3rd, or 23rd mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah, um, when we get down to, I do want to talk to, to the group and to the chair about just meetings in the summer. A lot of these advisories don't meet in the summer, okay. or how is that all going to work, just to make sure that we're... Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, so the next um, one is Guatemalan Mayan Center, uh, Maya Center, and we do have Mariana Blanco. That will be joining us. And again, uh, Marianne, um, welcome. Your name will go June fifteenth, I think it is. Um, and okay. at that point, you'll be officially uh, a voting member. So glad to have you here. Thank you. Welcome, Marianna. Thank you. Um, Haitian American Solidarity Center has dissolved. Um, I did speak with another agency this past, last week, um, Haitian Education um, Association, HEA, and they're quite quiet, but pretty dominant um, in the schools. And a lot of them are actually staff of the school district. So I don't know how that's gonna work. Um, but I, I did meet with a couple of the individuals from HEA and um, that was another association that um, was interested in serving in the capacity that Haitian American Solidarity Center um, served. So I just have, I've shared the information with the young lady. I actually need to follow up and send her an email of what she needs to do to, and reach out to staff. So, and we'll, are we going to go with that after, right, about where there's potential to add, a right. recommendation to add? Right. And what was that, Haitian what was it called? Haitian, Amer no, Haitian Education Association. Oh. I actually met her at a, a rehearsal at points in high school and uh, the award ceremony there. And then I saw her again at Atlantic. So um, it was somehow connected with the schools. Keith, this group has been in existence for a long time. Yeah, they, they were pretty silent. And I, I have joined some of the meetings. It, yeah, that would be a good uh, group to represent uh, the Haitian solidarity. There's a bunch of Haitian doctors, um, the professional that joined that group. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> okay. Did you finish the vacant ones? Yes. Um, no. Well, the last one is Division of Blind Services of Florida Department of Education. The last person that served on that was um, uh, Miss Bobby, and Bobby has been a long time served. Uh, she served for quite a long time, and then after Bobby, we hadn't heard from the Department of Education, probably around the pandemic time. Does anybody, Kim, are you aware, know anyone? Didn't I have a gentleman representing them and he passed away? I can't remember his name. I think it was a gentleman and Bobby that was the alternate, then Bobby became the, um, she became the, the main person that was the face of the, assist, or the voice for that association or agency. And then I haven't seen anyone after that. I know she said she had to step down. Okay. So because of health issues, if I'm not mistaken. So what they I, don't I'm, have a rep then. So uh, I'll see if Kevin McCormick could reach out, um, ESC director, to reach out to see if someone's I'm going to... Keith, I'm going to pause. Um, I'm going to mute myself and, and take care of this really quickly. If you can go ahead and proceed with um, the agencies not in attendance. Yes. Okay, so I'll reach out to Kevin McCormick to contact to see if we can try to get someone to participate. And we'll pick that up from there. Um, now, on some of these where we have some attendance um, challenges, um, I just want to, and then uh, if you could let me know also if I miss any, Susan, mm -hmm. for attendance. 
So Coalition for Black City Achievement, Dr. Robinson, are you able to see if we can get a substitute? And also, I can also reach out to, to Ms. Baysmore, um, but perhaps we can get an alternative if you're still on. I will talk with Dr. Robinson after. She may be multitasking. Um, just going down the list. Uh, Gold Coast Down Center, I know Sue's usually here. She missed a couple, so I don't know if she's just got something going on. Have you heard from her, Kim? No. All right, I'll reach out to Sue. Um, <clears throat> Maria Tuna, you said was sick, uh, Mr. Pagan? Maria's sick, you said, Atuna? Sorry? Maria Tuna, you said was sick? Maria Antonia. No, no, uh, no, Maria, Evelyn Vargas. Which okay. Is, that was my alternative. Oh, that's for your alternative. Yes, yes. I don't know that the alternatives um, always show up. I think they're, the, you know, primarily to show up if the main person can't make it, although they're welcome, I'm sure. Maria is usually here, so. Yeah, I, I know. I'm just saying if she isn't here, um, they're still well represented by one. Yeah. Um, let's go on this. Mr. Oswald, if you could just say the name of the organization that you're referring to, in addition to the individual's name, I don't. Some of us don't have the attendance sheet, so we're not as familiar with who yes. these persons are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tri Cities Education Council. I know. Um, so it's called, you talked to Mary Evans. I spoke to Mary one time, but she's never gotten back to me. Okay. So we can reach. I can reach out to to Mary, Miss Evans, regarding Tri Cities. Um, any others that I missed, Miss Holska? Organizations With, regarding attendance. I'm checking them off. I think that's we hit them up. Yep. So I think yep, we're doing pretty good. Yep. Okay. So. Um, so we have some of the homework for the ones that are missing. If we want to move into a discussion, there's been some conversations in previous meetings or organizations that um, are expressing an interest to join um, where there might be potential gaps in representing students that we serve here in Palm Beach County. Um, so I see one hand online, Kim, and then one in here with Ms. Guthrie. So Kim and then Ms. Guthrie. Um, I nominate the um, Florida Association, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Learning Disabilities Association of Florida. Um, the reason I think it's important that they um, are here is that of um, the students, um, ESC students in the district, they, um, students with learning disabilities are probably by far the largest group. Um, and often are very vocal in the ESC advisory, um, but it might, you know, it might be helpful to have their voice as well. I know they're not one of, disabilities aren't one of the groups that you listed, because I'm confident that Sue will be back, and I'm not quite sure why she's not here, but, um, and I know Division of Blind Services, but I, still nominate um, LDA. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Okay, we can come back to that, but first let me go to Ms. Guthrie. Yeah, so I just wanted to update about the NAACP, West Palm NAACP. Previously, I was listed as the alternative. And Ms. Mondesir, Rachel Mondesir, was listed as the representative. Um, I will now serve as the representative, and Ms. Mondesir, we're working to find an alternate for Ms. Mondesir. So I don't know if that requires any specific changes to the board, but um, the ordering probably needs to be relisted, and we'll be working on an alternate. 
is that even if her name was already ratified to be really I mean we can leave it as is and we can no, just, that's, but we have to find someone No, we'll else. work on it. We'll find someone I didn't realize the, in in any in any in any regard, so It's that specific. <laughs> the primary versus the alternative. Wow. Okay, we'll, we'll double check that. All right. Um All right. And did we address the Urban League? Do we have a rep there? I don't know that. From who? Urban League. Terrence Reed. I didn't hear that one. Yeah, I didn't hear that one. Are we oh, good thank with you. that attendance? Sorry, I'm, I'm missed that sure one. That I... um, we are we not. We on. are not good with yeah. attendance. That's what thank I you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anybody have a contact that they want to reach out? We will as well. I do. The Urban League? Yeah. I think we can. So Dr. Robinson just put in the chat box, sent a letter from the organization with the position changes. I'm sorry? Um, if you could put in writing the position changes that you just talked about with um, NAACP. And yes. That- I, I will... Um Send that to uh, send that into staff. Um, essentially, yep. what I said was, I will yep. be serving as the representative, and we are identifying an alternate. Yes, perfect. If you put that, then we can ratify you as the primary. Absolutely. So uh, I was speaking with uh, Dr. Fishbane, who uh, oversees the SHAC committee, which is a school health advisory committee. Um, it, it's not an organization, but I see some other advisory committees here, and they're required by state statute. They'd like to have a representative here. So staff member Pete Stewart, um, and I did see, I think, Marsha Fishbane had joined um, as a as a guest right now. So so you're putting, you're rep- re- recommending that SHAC be a representative from SHAC to be considered. The School Health Advisory Committee. Correct. Okay. Okay, so so back to, um, we can go back to Kim's recommendation. So was regarding Learn Dis- Disability Association. Um, so currently we have... Um, Uh, just kind of, so go coast ESC advisory um, division of blind services so I think there's three currently three organizations um, an FAU card so so there's currently four organizations around students with disabilities so I just want to be transparent on that. Um, Kim, do you want to talk any more about like uh, rationales to Learning Disability Association? Does anybody have any questions about that recommendation from Kim? It is a large population within the district um, and a large population within ESC. Um, it looks like there's some duplication in some of the missing organizations. But of course, if any of them want to send someone back, um, I wouldn't suggest um, taking over them. But um, as I said, I think it would give a broader cross-section of students with disabilities. And it's one of the areas where I think the school district could um, benefit from input from parents on that, um, or you know, like the population somebody representing it. It's one of the more difficult ones for ESC to handle, I believe, and so they may be able to um, provide insight on that. Okay. Ms. Guthrie? Yeah, so I, I thank you, uh, Mr. Oswald. I had a question just of, in terms of the overall balance of some of these committees, and um, let me preface this by saying I recognize that no one group uh, is the central and only voice for any specific population. So having said that, 
it does seem that the roster has some imbalances. We have several organizations representing the Hispanic Latinx community. We have several organizations representing the um, ESC community. And I actually do like the one uh, on the learning disability because my own child has a learning disability. So I think that is should be represented. before. But before we go there, I think I need to, we should have an understanding of just the some of the, the number of committees representing specific populations and whether or not we need to fill all of those slots and then add additional slots. So that would be my only preface to Ms. Uh, Spire O's recommendation. And then I see groups missing, right? I don't necessarily see an organization here that supports children who are homeless, children who are foster care, children who may be um, participating in the uh, dependency si uh, juvenile justice systems. And so there's a number of organizations representing the same populations, and then yet there are some populations that have no organization represent representing the interests of those students, right? So I would suggest Friends of Foster Children for, for children in, in, in that system. And certainly I would love to see somebody who's representing children who are considered homeless on this committee as well as those who are interacting with the Department of Juvenile Justice. Um, does anybody know of a, an agency that represents um, students who are homeless? Uh, the county has a yeah. committee. Yeah, I was gonna say okay. that. The I just can't, I didn't wanna say the wrong name, but certainly we can, there are organizations out there that represents these populations and I'd be happy to like I said, reach out to some of these, but I'm concerned that there are whole groups that are missing and then lots of multiplication of other groups on this committee. Mm -hmm. Another one that I was thinking of is the Association of Caregiving oh, Youth. Yes. yes. Obviously, oh, yeah. we would have to reach out to them and see if they want to commit because there's a lot of people who want to and then they don't come every month. So really setting that tone with them before we get them approved by the board, I think, for any of the new people. And for those who don't know, Caregiving Youth, Association for American Caregiving or Association? Yeah, American Association for Caregiving Youth. American Association. So they provide support to, I'm one of the few places and throughout the country, provide support for students who are caregivers of family members at home. Yes. May, I, may I make a comment? She made a comment about multiple um, groups representing, let's say, Hispanics and all of that. Well, number one, I want to see where the Hispanic country is located because one size does not fit all. We have representation of 21 countries in our Chamber of Commerce, all the way from Mexico to Dancing the Tango in Argentina and the Caribbean. So it's different cultures, different people. It's not one size the same. Mr. Pagan, if you, with all due respect, I said, please let me preface that I understand that no one group represents any specific population. I Thank stated you. that before I made the comment, and I said, so we should understand what are the demarcations between the groups that are on this committee? What is the purpose that we're having one specific group versus another? Where does one start, where does one end? We don't understand that. And so if there's somewhere that we could get a description of these organizations to say, the Hispanic Chamber serves this particular population, these sets of countries, this other one represents this group, because on the surface, if you're just looking at it as a layperson, you may say, wait, I, f I feel like I'm missing, and I see five organizations serving a specific population. So I did preface my comments, but thank you for you. I, I no, no, absolutely you're, you're, agree with you. We are not a totally, monolithic totally correct. community. And that's the main reason we proceeded to change the name from Puerto Rican Hispanic Chamber, because one of the approaches we get all the time is, oh, you have to be Puerto Rican to belong? Yeah. Right. No. Right. So I'm having that, that kind of how do we say, diversity yeah. that we have in our organization. That's when in 2020, we changed the name to Florida Hispanic American Chamber of Commerce. You know, so we're trying to Makes help. Sense. Right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to throw one other um, organization in for the, um, to represent homeless youth. It's Vita Nova. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Vita Nova? Mm -hmm. yeah. They're going to be super busy. V-I-T-A mm -hmm. yep. and O-V-A. For homeless. Um, yeah. 
United they work with Correct. kids that have aged out of the foster care unit and also because their services are 18 and up. Yeah, absolutely good one. Too. Also, uh, Kim has her hand raised and typed in a couple. Kim, you want to read out to the group? Uh, Dr. Robinson was ahead of me. Um, oh. And then I, I'll go. Sorry, I'm multitasking. So, here. Uh, no, I took my hand down. I think I should oh. say what I was thinking. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. I, I just saw it go up. Um, we're missing the Asian um, yeah. mm -hmm. API. API. Or do I have it wrong? Um, Asian community, I know it's not as big as some of the others. Um, indigenous population. I did try to reach out at one point to um, the Muslim American Center, but they never showed up. Um, but I'm just thinking some of the other ones that are missing that don't have any representation. There is an organization that supports uh, students um, that identifies Muslim. Um, in fact, they reached out to, to us about the calendar. I mm -hmm. cannot remember their name, but I can, I'll take, there is one that is out there. Uh, that may would might be interested in participating if we move that way. Um, Undocumented too. Um, undocumented. Just writing down, Eric. So we're creating quite a list here, um, which is good. For the undocumented or unaccompanied youth minors. We just did a presentation for the U.S. Committee on Refugees and Immigrants, so they have a really good team. They may be interested, okay. and they're located in Lake Worth. Okay. Um, you brought up uh, those uh, around DJJ or court-involved students, so there is the... Um, Circuit 15, Ms. Fishman, you can help me. You know what I'm talking about. Yes. Circuit I, 15 I, advisory, DJJ yeah, we, advisory committee. We have the JA, JGAB. I mean, there's a number of groups, but I, I think I would try to figure out what is the right organization. Is the is it the organization that operates like the Since Fins program versus one of these kinds of – I know we have some coalitions on here, so it's not that it has to be an organization. But there are also, um, on the DJJ side, just a number of things that's happening in that arena right now because some of the recent legislation and changes, so some redesign of some of the groups. Um, so I want to kind of give some thinking to that. But I committed to follow up on the at least those that I mentioned, um, the foster care, the DJJ, and what well, we recommended, Vita Nova, for homeless, um, homeless youth, and there could be another. And since Finn's... Children's Home Society. Yeah, Children's Home Society. It's Children's Home Society for those not familiar. Um, um, I do like the sense fence because we do have a lot of issues with attendance and yeah. issues around that. Um, Dr. Robinson? Yeah, thank you. So I think this conversation is really good, really valuable. Um, but I'm a little bit troubled that it seems like we're moving more and more to the people. And I'm gonna say this in a mean way, the people that profit off of these children, right? As opposed to the true advocates for these children. I mean, they, and I, I get that they cross pollinate. I get, you know, just because you're on the Circuit 15, DJJ, whatever, doesn't mean you're not a true advocate. But what I'm saying is that when you start getting into these organizations um, whose job it is to be part of the bureaucracy that impacts these children and at times um, may maybe, I'm just saying maybe, part of the problem. So I'm just going to ask that as we think of each one of these groups, and I think it's really good that we're expanding these groups, that we're specifically looking for the voice directly, as close to directly from that group as possible. Yeah, I would agree. Thank you for those comments. 
and some head nods here in the room as well. And so, so part of this we identified specific organizations versus, and then in some cases we identified areas where the voice is, made, is not heard as loud through this committee. So, and, and for legal, currently um, the policy specifically uh, names that is comprised of 22 voting. So if it was to go beyond that or if it's replacement for those who have been dissolved, the 22 would also have to be a recommendation. If we were going to go larger than the 22, if you can just clarify that, please. That's correct. So you can make the recommendation that it be more than the 22 organizations. Um, just know that you still have to meet that quorum. So the additional addition of organizations means more people have to be there for your quorum. So in case you didn't hear, so, so yes, potentially that would ha also have to be a change. And then also then that involves quorum issues too. So it raises our number yeah, for Yeah, historically we had had issues with quorum and so we removed some people off so that's why it would be kind of I'd be interested before we get them started that they attend even as non-voting members first that they can commit to this before we get them out because then it's going to take forever to get them off right. <laughs> yeah. we can't do anything about quorum what constitutes quorum correct no I think right now it's like 50 more percent. Okay. 50 plus one. Yeah. And that's governed by another policy. Got it. Yeah. Um, a lot of us are involved in other organizations and coalitions. So maybe when we're making suggestions and we know the organizations we're talking about and possibly their leadership or liaisons to the outside, um, if we know these people tend to show up and tend to be um, the doers, um, I think we should consider that in um, making our decisions. I'm pretty sure in some of the suggestions that we have worked, you know, the people making the suggestions have worked with these organizations and might have a sense of who is really going to participate. Uh, agree. I want to see if we can try to narrow down. Um, not necessarily the organization, but the student voice, if I could, if my notes are serving me well. So we have special needs, um, slash like ESE. Um, just because I can't think of a better name right now, school health, um, foster care, court involved. So I want to stick away from DJJ because there are just court involved in general. Um, or someone's got a better name. Undocumented. Um, caregiving students. Um, Asian. Indigenous. And Muslims. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I have nine buckets. Did you have homeless? I didn't hear it. It might have been there. No, I didn't. I do, but I'm not in my new list. <laughs> so homeless, thank you. So so we identified Are you sorry, are you are you naming all buckets LGBTQ just, should be or are you just talking no, about new just ones? The ones that we okay. currently don't have that we feel we don't have a voice from what I heard from the discussion so far. So homeless Homelessness, special needs, just through the conversation. We do have special needs recommend, but through the conversation. Um, uh, school health. Um, I don't know if that's a specific voice. And Mr. Stewart, since you're here, do you want to clarify if that's a specific student voice that you're thinking of? Um, and for those who don't know what SHAC is, it's the School Health Advisory Committee. It's governed by a a statute that um, it's comprised of representation of the community that work with um, everything kind of health related, which is kind of a large bucket, as well as stu school district representation. Sure. So uh, the thought behind that, as you mentioned, they're governed by statute. They're an advisory committee. They do cross cut uh, regarding health and, and issues related to school health. So 
Uh, they also have monthly meetings that a number of organizations who are specific to health and even more specific to school health uh, attend every month. Uh, the thought was that they started a subcommittee related to racial equity, um, and we felt that we didn't want to see a duplicitous process. So if they could attend uh, either as a member or maybe a ad hoc member to advise on health issues or uh, something to that effect, um, and then rather than having two committees, perhaps you could have one that reported back and forth between the two. Okay. So, uh, But they so do that, not represent an, act, a, 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 an, an individual or specific uh, uh, diverse group of students. They represent all students from the aspect of health and, and specifically school health. Yep. Thank you. So homelessness, special needs, uh, Shack School Health, uh, foster care, court-involved, undocumented caregiving, students, uh, Asian, Asian-American, indigenous, and Muslim. So I, I'm at 10. I do want to weigh in on my own thoughts, too, on this. When I look about the students who are experiencing the most challenges in the system and represent relatively large and probably have the some of the most the wor uh, worst outcomes are probably the students who identify as homelessness, those that are foster care, um, and those that are court involved have some serious uh, challenges working in the system, staying in the system, and then actually graduating with a standard high school diploma to move forward. Um, and it does cut across, I think, race, gender, yeah. ethnicity, et cetera. So those are my thoughts. So I. I so I don't know if, so currently, again, we had 22 voting. If we were considering to prioritize the list, I don't know, is there just concern about maybe trying to prioritize? I think adding 10 is a little yeah. somewhat excessive. I don't think we'll get much how many? Back. How many did, how many dissolved? How many did we lose of the 22? Maybe we should start there because the 22 I don't think is a is a, a, a real number it seemed just from today is more like maybe 18 19 I'm not quite sure um, Aspira closed so we currently have two this hi everyone I'm back um, we currently have two dissolved but one of them that dissolved is um, a voice one I mean one of the there's two that's dissolved out of the six agencies that are vacant um, one of them are the Haitian population that is not currently represented at all. That I think we need to definitely prioritize. Um, it well, looks like someone suggested um, a replacement, though. Yes, there was a replacement that was suggested. Um, so just that's, that's the FYI to, to that list of Haitian, but we currently don't have an active vacant, uh, an active Haitian voice that's on the table. So that list can actually go to on uh, Mr. Oswald's list as a who do we whose voices are currently not at the table. Okay. The Haitian voices is not at the table. Add that. Okay. So, so with that conversation, so essentially one. Which one? Okay. I thought it was a little bit more. I thought it was three. <laughs> I forgot we had some swapping in and some swapping out. The other population that I would, I mean, since we're just making lists for brainstorm, that I would add is uh, Caribbean students, right? So students of Caribbean descent, um, specifically. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So. That puts us with adding the Haitian voice um, up to 12. So. Um, I would suggest if Division of Blind Services isn't going to send someone, that LDA could replace it. But otherwise, I understand. I would rather have other people represented if we have to cut. Or prioritize. Um, um, 
so to, to work to prioritize this list, um, I'm trying to think how the best to move this forward, <laughs> Madam Chair, but do we want to, I don't think I can make a recommendation, but you heard where I choose, I, I, you know, what I think the students are experiencing the biggest challenges. Um, I think it's important to look at the data, and if that's what our trends are showing, that's who we should prioritize. Data. Why don't I think of that? <laughs> right. Um, and so, so within that, so that is a really good point about using data because I could try to run some numbers for each of these. Obviously, wouldn't have that for undocumented. Um, but for some of these. Might be able to provide some numbers of percent of population or rough estimates. That um, Maria Mariana mentioned that her organization represents undocumented students, so that may help us um, with narrowing down. Uh, Guatemala Mayan Center. All right. The Guatemala Mayan Center. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, work a lot with indigenous families and um, the migrant community, so that is basically all undocumented recent arrivals. Not just Guatemalan. No, we work with uh, people from. We work with anyone who comes in, uh, but mainly recent arrivals of migrant families. So uh, a lot of them are Guatemalan, Haitian, Central American. Got it. That's good. And through this committee, if we were to recommend to the board to raise the number of participants, what do you think is a comfortable number so I know, so we could look at what we're trying to prioritize the most and additional to? Um, I probably wouldn't go past 25 given the quorum. Issue. Yeah, 25 was the highest number I thought, if even that. I would be interested to see what our attendance has been for the last year and making sure that we could get that quorum, even if just the ones that usually come stay. So in the room here, 25, they, it's kind of a comfortable number that no one would want to go higher than that. Anybody um, online? So, so I, I, I wouldn't go higher than 25, I agree. But as I look at, I believe it was, oh, Mix my things so up. It was academic advisory committee. Like there's other committees that have voting members, or I'm sorry, it's ISSOC, and I could pull it up really quickly. ISSOC is um, they have a way in their policy, or they in their policy they have a provision that has voting members, and then they have a provision that has non-voting members, but members. I have to look it up to exactly share how it's written out. Um, but maybe we can consider that as well. Um, give me a second and I'll pull it up. Which policy? So they're able to speak and provide advice but not vote? Yes. yes. Um, you can continue and I will look it up really, I'll grab the policy, look it up and see if I can share my screen. Legal's also looking up. Um, oh, okay. Morgan. Okay, so um, so the Haitian voice would probably more than likely would be a replacement, right? Um, uh, and one dissolved, so so it's twenty two, um, and Cassandra is about to come in. She, her organization is also interested, right, Ms. Postal? So I'm sorry, I found the information. If I didn't so they have um, 16 members, and at, like ISSOC it was. They have 16 members um, of the ISSOC um, that's appointed, and then they have um, three non-voting members, but it's two non-voting members of the committee um, that are represented from Principals Association and the Classroom Teacher Association. I wonder if this changed because Palm Beach County PTA used to be on here too, but um, I don't, you know, I no longer see it on here. 
but now it's um, Palm, um, Palm Beach Principals Association and Classroom Teachers Association. They're non-voting members. Okay. Um. I just don't know how we would manage if a particular population is being represented and that, that they can't vote. I mean, we'd have to end up into some kind of voting Olympics, like if there are four organizations representing kind the of some extension network. of the same population that they get one vote, but it would be hard if we only had, say we invited the home, a, a group representing homeless students and saying because we met our number, you can join the committee, but you can't vote when you represent maybe the only voice of that particular community. So I don't know how non-voting members in this type of situation would work to our benefit. And our attorney, Ms. Morgan. There's also a distinction with these non-voting members. These, oh, sorry. There's also a distinction with these non-voting members. These non-voting members are employees of the school district, so they're not necessarily community members. Got it. Dr. Robinson, his hands are raised. Yeah, thank you. So I think that's a very interesting point, though, about the comparison to um, to the um, infrastructure sales tax. No, I thought it was parents. That's oh. I said you can discard it because I thought it was said parents. No, but I'm asking to not discard it. And let me tell oh. you why. Okay. Right? So the purpose of this committee is to bring voices together that are not normally heard, right, mm -hmm. in the course of district business, right? We're trying to change the heart and minds as well as the policies and practices, right, of the school district. Mm -hmm. So so these conversations take place in isolation from the people that we're trying to change the hearts and minds of. So I think it actually would be a very good thing to ask the, the Administrators Association and CTA and I will consider the other bargaining units, but to have, invite them to have non-voting members at this table and then ask them when they have their um, monthly meetings to basically report back what they've learned here. Because see, somehow mm -hmm. we have to move this work out of this little box that box. we're in. Like we talk to each other, mm -hmm. right? And it's some good movement happening, but I think it's time now to start making sure the people who would need to understand this, um, hear it, like quote, from the horse's mouth, right? So, and like, so let's say, we make some changes in policy and then that gets dictated from on high to principals and teachers and so forth. But how, how is that message received if it, if it comes like that versus one of their colleagues saying, yeah, and, I, and you know, it was a really good conversation and what I took away from it was blah, blah, blah. And therefore practices are being recommended to change like this. Like I just, I think that's something to be considered. I actually think that's yeah, a fantastic would. idea, especially when we look at all the areas we covered this year and the conversations that occurred for those organizations that represent the teachers' union, the principals' association, or the school administrators' association to take that back because there was a lot of richness, mm -hmm. I think, in the conversations that we've had this year with legislation and not to rehash. And I'm sure we all yeah, it's like, PTSD. why am I here? <laughs> but, but I'm not voting. Yeah. Any thoughts about Dr. Robinson's and Ms. Postle's recommendation? I actually love that idea. I mean, I'm just jumping in, but um, I, I actually love that idea. And that that it, that seems to be like there. That might be the missing one of the missing links to get this. What we're trying to do to permeate and penetrate the district. Um, and I just never thought about that. And again, I, I, I love that idea. And maybe there are others um, as well that should also be charged with being here and taking it back and sharing what they learn. School police. Yeah, I'm sure we, we could we could brainstorm some ideas. Um, so let's 
bring it back in. Um, so uh, I, I agree with school police, but let's bring it back into the, the voices because we said 25 and we're like at 30. Um, right now. So, so what, what I would like to recommend um, is to work to kind of prioritize maybe, but I will have to look at different data pieces, but try to prioritize by the number of students serve the list to bring back to next meeting. Um, and then if others can be thinking through also potentially organizations, additional organizations that we didn't already discuss here that might represent certain populations. And before, you know, Cassandra, Ms. Thaddeus, you had come at another meeting. What was, and I want to make sure I capture the organization that you brought up. I think I have an email as well, but. If you yeah, could it just was Connect to Greatness. And Connect Greatness is targeting what population of students? Because before you came out, we were talking about voices yep. not being heard. Yep. So it's targeting African-American black boys, including our Haitian-American boys from elementary through high school. Thank you. What was school health? School health advisory committee. What was it? Yes, I'm sorry. I was. I think that's when I came in. I heard a little tad bit, but I did not hear what was that. So it's a committee that's required by a statute that addresses all health-related type issues. It's comprised of community members in the health-related field, and health being a very broad. Um, we're talking everything from social emotional to um, physical. Um, health and as well as district um, staff as well. So you, you'll see. I, I would recommend that that one be one of the non voting advisories since they are not um, necessarily representing an underserved community. And I also, in our consideration of the most populous groups, also um, kind of add a factor of the most vulnerable groups. Right. So I don't know how many homeless children or foster children, but and um, children involved with the juvenile justice system or the justice system in general, but I would say those are very vulnerable groups whose voices I personally would like to hear. I, but when we also think about these things, these are voices, when we say voices at the table, um, district, well, let's go. His, Hispanic Chambers of Commerce, um, Palm Beach County Council of PTA, Puerto Rican Chambers, West Palm Beach Chapter of NAACP, the Tri-County, Urban League, um, Coalition for Black Student of Achievement, Gold Coast, uh, maybe Down Syndrome, Economic Council. These organizations, I, and I don't want to speak for them, but many of these organizations can identify students that are in their population, that are in their groups, that are homeless, special needs, possibly foster care, but we could get a voice that's in the uh, foster care or caregiving um, arena. But D DJJ, court involved, some of us don't have that those those data. We don't have the, that voice at the table because we don't. Um, student voices, each of the representatives we should have some student voices at, in our respective organizations. So I don't want to isolate, let's find somebody that talk about student voices when, or black students, when we have several groups, Coalition of Black Student Achievement, Urban League, um, that's already, that already have a voice at the table or can identify someone um, in these particular voices that we said that are not currently represented in the DDEC. Now, Dr. Robinson. Amy has her hand up. And okay, thank Kimberly you. said it. Um, I, I wanted to just, um, I missed out on part of the SHAC recommend recommendation too, but I'm, I'm on SHAC, right? I'm, I'm going to suggest that we consider the reverse, right? Not to invite SHAC to this meeting or a representative from SHAC to this meeting, but to have somebody else who has an equity lens in the shack meeting because i'm telling you it's it's missing over there right um it's well it's sparse how about that and so instead of growing this committee if there's just and maybe it's a non-voting i you know i don't know what the um statute is about shack um but if nothing else 
somebody from this committee could regularly attend SHAC as a, a member of the public, if nothing else, right? And they don't get as formal as, as I can recall with the voting and everything. So it's mostly a series of happy reports. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. But I, but I would suggest the reverse. If somebody with an equity lens participate in SHAC as opposed to adding somebody from SHAC here, Nice. Good suggestion. And, and, and I would also suggest maybe you create a subcommittee of three or four people to bring back to next month's meeting a recommendation because you kind of operate with a blank piece of paper and that takes a long time. So there's been a lot of input. I would suggest that, you know, you can designate another subcommittee to, to argue it out and then bring it back to this group and be able to to tell why you reached the conclusions you reached. So it can get locked down to go to the board after the next meeting, I would hope. Yeah, so that's what I want to work towards, taking that input and Dr. Robinson's favorite word based on what Kim said around those who are most vulnerable, percent, maybe try to slightly create a rubric um, to kind of weight that and then bring back some of the organizations that we heard um, to the the next meeting, um, and then is that just a? <laughs> well, I had my hand raised earlier, but Kimberly said what I was going to say. But I have other recommendations on the policy. So is that something I would say now, or would it? Would I submit that via email? We can go to that. I think once we finish here. Okay. Um, is that is you had your hand, yes, is that your hand raised? Yes, I have a. Um, is it okay for me to? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was just curious if we had inventoried the missing voices, right? Because I'm I'm hearing I heard a lot of conversation and it's like a, we don't know and do we know who's that's missing? What, like, have we said this? Yes, missing? that's what we were doing when you uh, prior oh. to you coming out. Okay. All right. Yeah, Thanks. the missing voices. I have a question. When Ms. Godfrey, I'm sorry, is that what you said? Yes, that's what yeah. we were working through prior to you coming on to the meeting. Okay. Prioritizing, yeah, those voices not being heard. You know, it was a comment regarding to what Ms. Godfrey said earlier regarding homeless children. What Ms. Robinson, uh, Dr. Robinson was saying about other organizations. How we explore, for example, the, Lord, the Lord's Place shows us a homeless organization in the county, the Covenant House as in, in the county as a homeless organization. So I'm thinking, do they have information about children who are hom homeless? Because that's the first place that these people go. So Lord's Place is one um, that where some go, but there are many organizations that support students who experience homelessness, or families, I should say, experiencing homelessness. Um, yeah, adopt a family. There's another one that I can't think of. Yeah, there's a right there's now. actually a coalition. I can't remember the name. I mean, you have the homeless so, coalition. There's a number of them, but coalition. I think to Dr. Robinson's point, not you know, we've identified the population. We want to take a keener look at is there a grassroots organization within that space that is really present, advocate, and not just a system leader, which is why I was shying away from some of the the big names or the big coalitions and collaboratives that serve some of those populations because you can just get marred up in bureaucracy as we often do in those settings. And so thinking through like, okay, so what specific organization like an Aspira or others, we would say these are really boots on the ground organizations who are filling in the gaps for children who experience any number of these issues that we just spoke about. So I think that takes a little bit more thinking um, and not just kind of the ones that are sometimes top of mind for, for many of us. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, so um, I think we're ready to move on from the list and look at other aspects. I know Ms. Kenny has a um, recommendation in a different part, if that's, Madam Chair, everybody um, good about the organizations? I think it was a yeah, very, pretty good. a great, great conversation. 
Um, any other recommendations regarding the policy as a whole, aside from the listed um, devices? I have two little things. This is Emmy. Oh, Emily. Okay. Um, one is I, I know that Pete Stewart is here pretty much every meeting. He's usually uh, has reserves his comments for public comment. Um, but Pete is with the African, African American, Latino Holocaust and Gender Studies Department. Also, Brian Knowles is part of that department. And I'm wondering if they can have a seat at the table to provide insight on the many questions we ask that we don't always, just as a staff member that's that's up here at the table. He's here right now for people online who can't see him. But um, I just think that especially due to the current climate, um, this department is a crucial voice and I, I want to, I don't want to have to just limit what he can say to two minutes at the end of our meetings. And I think, Reggie, are you? No, if you can please mute yourself. Or I'm going to mute her for, um, like, uh, so I think with, what Dr. Robertson was saying, what was supposed to brought up about the non-voting members. Yeah. Maybe a, like a district staff type. Yeah. We could look at some kind of wording, but it, it yep. does make sense. Um, yep. Just want to throw that in there. And also there's a, a tiny little thing. Um, it's in section 4C. It's talking about DDE subcommittees. And if you go to the end of, of that um, section, it says physically present. The quorum shall be a majority of the DDEC subcommittee members or their alternates. If a member is not present, are physically present, and their meetings must be in the sunshine. I'm wondering if we can take out that word physically, since we do uh, hybrid meetings now. We, yeah, we can update it based on the other policy. Yeah, so yes. that's an update that needs to be. Thank you. Good catch. That's but that a policy, that is, um, that's a policy that's going to have to be updated. I mean, that's a burden that might have to be updated in all of the um, other policies as I'm reviewing. I think that was because we got, and that, that was my question, Keith, if at some point we were, um, if the the lax or the, the, the what is it, temporary, um, or that's more of a legal question, if the temporary um, permission to have hybrid meetings or online virtual meetings, if that was completely, um, if that was something that was completely reverted to that we can do, or is that something that, hey, that was, I mean, if that was temporary, or is that a permanent decision that we can now go to hybrid and physical, because that was during the pandemic and during the, you know, Legal is going to weigh in here. Right. Ms. So um, we have changed policies that board committees are able to meet virtually. Um, but since we are going through the pol sorry, since we are going through the policy uh, development process, the wording in this policy will also be updated. Perfect. Um, in addition to this policy, so one um, through through Ms. Morgan as well as some other attorneys. We are looking at some of this to see if, in light of new legislation that occurred, that we all talked throughout this, if any other wording needs to be changed. So um, I'll just, you know, Section 3E, right, where the DDC may recommend implementation of PD plan that includes cultural competency, anti-racism, and ethno-cultural equity for all district employees. But the word recommend makes it okay to not have to change, but obviously with part of that woke um, bill, there's some implications when it comes to particular trainings that we just got to look at to see if it need, the policy is in alignment with new statute. Isn't that more curriculum and teaching the kids, or is it everything? No, there's one around training of employees for any, uh, any organization, including your own organizations potentially. Um, mandating certain types of training mm -hmm. after July 1. So, Even just under purpose and mission, are we going to be able to keep gender identity or expression, sexual orientation in that first paragraph? I'd hope so. Yeah, I don't that. see yeah. That, yeah. Okay. that being an issue. 
No, I don't see that being a... Does anybody have anything else when it comes to the policy? I would just say if for some reason there is state pushback on our policy to expand to virtual meetings, that I would like to put in a request for reasonable accommodation under the ADA as a person with um, severe autoimmune um, issues and um, the research that says that if I were to get sick with COVID and it hasn't gone away by the way, um, that I would end up being a long hauler and I can't really afford another thing on top. So if for some reason the state tries that, um, I think federal law trumps that. Legal is shaking her head. So I, I don't see it being an issue though. It won't be an issue at this point uh, based on the other, other policies that were changed and things that change in legislation. So I think we'll be okay, okay. on that. So, um, uh, great uh, conversation. So I'm going to work to kind of update all that to bring it to the next meeting to, so hopefully we can bring forth some final recommendations, Madam Chair, um, for this group, but definitely great input. And um, for just, so I know, I, I believe it was this meeting and last meeting, um, someone had asked um, what was the, uh, you know, how do we, share with individuals who would like to participate in the BDEC on um, what our purpose is and what we should be doing. Um, I think it's it's a good point to, you know, oftentimes we go back, I go back and read um, question or number three, A through G, uh, it, it outlines it, send them the policy, send them policy 1.0971 and uh, share I mean, the purpose and the mission is there, but share the actual responsibility of what the DDC should do um, and, and what we should be advising and um, recommending to the board and the superintendent. Um, so I just wanted to share that point. Any additional comments regarding the DDC committee um, or policy 1.0971? None in here. No additional comments. Um, so the agenda. Um, from Chief of Equity and Wellness. So, <laughs> yeah, so just uh, one of the things that we, um, that I've been tasked with, so the, the board um, has brought up um, in previous meetings throughout the year or so um, around creating a, an advisory comprised an advisory committee comprised of students. So I am working on a, a policy with legal to bring to the board in the very near future around a, a, a superintendent's advisory committee. Um, so as it's in, so this is going to be something brand new so it'll be an interesting committee to to also bring student voice to the table um, uh, through the office of the superintendent when that comes to fruition and you would be selecting students would you let us know so that we could tell the kids we work with to apply or would it be selected as um, I don't want to get too far ahead of the board on this one because we are keeping it somewhat broad and simple at this point um, to get feedback from the board um, on their intention. So I have some language that um, I'm going to take to the board. Actually, I'm hoping to take it June 1st to the board um, for just a workshop. Um, and we'll see how that goes so I can provide an update on how that goes at the next meeting. But uh, yeah. Essentially, I envision each board member um, uh, appointing one from their their district, um, as well as a superintendent and one from student government. So we're 
working through some of that now, but again, I don't want to get too far ahead of the board. So. Um, this is the first of its kind committee. Madam Chair, I have a suggestion. In a formal sense. Okay, hold on one second. I'm okay. sorry. I, I, I thought we were given a report, but I hear questions. So, so there's sure. a question on the, uh, in the room. Was is this the was this the first of its kind? I said this would be the first as a, a formal policy around a student advisory. There's been plenty of times where sprint, you know superintendent would meet with student groups, we'd move with student groups, but this would be more of a formal process in the sunshine, um, et cetera. So um, other, than, other than that, um, obviously as we close out the end of the year, we're really looking at the opening of next year around, you know, I don't really have a lot of other updates, just getting through the closing of school, we're continuing to try to um, work on a strong opening and some of the previous conversations that we've talked about from attendance issues and some of that so that we're have stronger systems in place to, to support those students come uh, opening of school next year which I'll have a more deeper update next time um, thank you are there any questions Reginald you're recognized yeah what I was gonna uh, suggest because we have so many organization here in this room when the board is ready to select kids, would it be nicer to have us selected a youth from each of those organizations to be a part of that council committee to the board? Thank you. I have a question if now is the appropriate time. Um, was that a recommendation? Did you have a or, or question, Reginald? I, I didn't keep you where you responded. Um, for, I think that was, uh, I think she gave feedback okay. for, for me Perfect. on that policy. Perfect. Next question. This is Emmy. I have a question for Mr. Oswald. This is a kind of a follow-up. At our last meeting here, we as a group made the recommendation to the board that um, since the Department of Education hasn't given any guidelines um, as far as um, updates with in the realm of HB 1557 that um, that the school district wouldn't pull any other books until that law, HB 1557, went into effect. And um, since that last meeting, a piece of 12th grade curriculum was removed, and it did have to do uh, with um, gender identity and sexual orientation. So and, my, and on that, oh, was that a question regarding the student and Mr. Oswald's report? Mike, no, it's a question for Mr. Oswald. Okay, can we put a pin on that and just have a little bit and go, because we're still, we have about 25 minutes left and I do want to get our um, agenda items covered so yeah. we can certainly touch that on new business. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Update on subcommittee um, district training. Okay, um, the subcommittee met this morning. Um, we have reviewed several trainings on su uh, youth suicide prevention. We found all of them lacking. One of the organizations that provides the, the current training to the school district um, through someone in the ESC advisory committee um, we've made contact with them and they would like to hear our input and might be open to changing their um, training um, in response to the suggestions we make. Um, so we do have a legal question and that is, are we as a group allowed to meet with an outside party or do we have to make it a public meeting, you know, to ask questions and provide input? I think I can answer it. it's going to have to be publicly advertised if it's more than one member of the committee so okay. if um, it's if it's one or less <laughs> okay um, so we will probably um are we allowed to do an email question through susan to ask what the committee wants to do about that because i would really love to get back to him as soon as you know in a reasonable amount of time so are you talking about meeting with uh, that foundation? Right. If we were, I want to just make sure the committee is okay with sending one representative so we can get back. 
but um, I want to check with the committee. So are we allowed to send or am I allowed to send that question to Susan and get the input of the committee and make a decision or do we have to wait till the next group meeting? Well, we're in the sunshine now. So, so well, think- OK, group members. Um, how do you want to handle it quickly? This is Emmy. I would recommend that you, Kimberly, act as our representative. Take the email points or the points that we're going to email you um, after this meeting and take that to the Jason Foundation. Carrie and Robin? I agree with that. I think that would be great. Okay. Um, we already arranged to get written input from everybody by Friday. So um, we're going to meet with, or I'm going to meet with the um, uh, Jason Foundation. Um, but the other things we've reviewed are lacking. Um, we plan to um, look at other trainings that um, may Can, be more Before you go to other, tra- before you go to, I just have a clarifying question. When you say tra- all the trainings you review, can you tell me which training specifically you reviewed? Um, the one that was required for this past year, which is the Jason Foundation um, Youth Suicide Training Module 2, um, we found that to be very vague and um, it left out um, information about students with disabilities and more importantly, um, LBGTQ and the most um, vulnerable population, the trans population, who are going to feel even worse over the next year and future with the new laws. Um, Thank you. It, the statistics and everything were from before 2014, um, and they didn't really give enough skills for school staff members to do something to help students. Um, we found, um, we also reviewed um, the Uh, Jason Foundation Module 5, and it was a little bit better, but still lacking a lot. And we also reviewed Acts on Facts, which was more recent and more interactive and better, but we still found it lacking in um, some of the, well, first of all, there's 2019 Youth Risk Survey, and theirs was in 2018, and we feel that recent um, statistics and recent, like dealing with recent issues. There's a lot going on in the world right now. Um, there are kids still recovering from COVID, um, the, you know, being shut down and separated from people. So we need to address current issues. Um, so CARD and has just a brand new- for point, another point of clarification so everybody understands the context, this is the required, correct me if I'm get this wrong, but the required training for suicide awareness that came out from last year's legislation. Yes, and Dr. Musenic said that for this coming year that they're going to change up the training every year so it's not repetitive. And so we would like to bro- provide feedback for this coming year. Um, and she was very receptive to our thoughts. So we're going to, um, we have an assignment to go and um, look at other trainings and come back as a group and recommend it. Also, um, we are going to develop a rubric for comparing the different trainings. Um, We haven't done that yet. We are going to, we have a whole list. Um, develop priorities for evaluating these trainings. So after we deal with the suicide, what are the really important things that are affecting students and staff that we need to address? And what about the population of police? They are in a different setting, so they're not getting the same trainings. What's important for them? Um, Bullying trainings, we wanna look at that Um, rubric. We, have, we would like to make a request that staff make a list of all the trainings that are required of staff and who receives them. And we're also requesting to So start only those that are required? Well, just, so to clarify, just, just to clarify, um, based on the trainings that you're seeing before us is um, with the Jason Foundation, 
youth suicide. Um, we did get clarification that's all just added on for contents. This is training for all staff. Um, we was told that does not include or we're getting clarification if that included um, permanent substitutes um, or you know active substitutes right now. But uh, according to someone from Ms. Mucinic's office, I don't remember um, the young lady's name, Kimberly, um, it was all staff received the Jason Foundation Youth Suicide Training. Um, today we were, rep uh, the representation was Anna Irizarry Cardona. Yes, correct. Um, so anyway, we have a large assignment for next time and we're asking to meet half an hour earlier um, so we can get more done because it's a really huge um, assignment. Um, there's a question about can the public contribute to our subcommittee's work and I don't know the answer to that. And it's open to the public, open to the public with public opportunity to comment just like any other advisory committee, absolutely. So three minutes. Uh, Kimberly, I have a quick question for clarity. Yes. Is there a uh, youth version of the suicide prevention training? We have, um, we started with the trainings that were um, approved by the state and the trainings that were on that list, we've, I think we've looked at them all and they don't, but we could try to look for something like that and recommend it. Um, although is SEL banned now? No, no, <laughs> we, no, it is not. Okay. I have a feeling that's coming down the pike from all the comments and stuff. So if for able, now, if they need to be able to find it first. It. We can call it suicide prevention. So if, if not, I, I just would put that out there for us to consider if there isn't a, a youth version, mm -hmm. we should consider having a youth version. And you can leave the, I mean, we don't even need to go into the whole SEL thing, just suicide prevention and we can figure it out. Okay. Um, the other comment that we all made is we we would love to see more training and we as a committee would like to help brainstorm how to make that possible. Cause I know there may not be, or I've heard from staff on other things that there may not be time there may be constraints from the union, um, et cetera. But we would love to fit more in and make sure that staff are getting a more comprehensive preparation for dealing with students. And that's it. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, are there any questions for Kimberly? I'm sorry, I know she get interrupted with questions in the middle of the presentation. I don't work. Doesn't work. Um, any further questions regarding um, Kimberly? Can you repeat the recommendations for us? Um, staff make a list of trainings. Yes. Um, well, the list that we have, and the only one that outside, you know, like outside of us, is asking the staff to make a list of all trainings, and if any of them are restricted to a certain group who would receive it. But I think most of them, as we said, are for everyone. But when we say required, Perfect. when we say required training, so there's a lot of required training. So in what specific, like say, so when we talk about suicide awareness, obviously that makes it a lot more easier to say. Well, we're which... going to establish priorities. And so by the next meeting, the end of the next meeting, you will know, I, I think bullying is high up there. I know if but I think the school district definitely could improve on that. I think all school districts. So could I would out. definitely agree with you. So, um, so perhaps first, and maybe this is for the larger group as well, Madam Chair, to consider maybe a, just a presentation around what we do to create that positive support of school climate, in particular with the lens around bullying, to kind of just go through some statutory requirements, some. How, and then as well as what we do to enhance the, the climate and culture on school campuses so that all students feel safe, knowing that there's room for improvement when it comes to fidelity at every single campus. Thank you. And then we're going to create a rubric for comparing the different trainings. Um, 
and we're going to expand the time if we can make that arrangement with staff. Thank you so much for um, you here typing. I'm actually typing comments. So thank you so much for your report, Ms. Kimberly. Um, moving on to new business. Are there any new business that comes before? Kim, um, Emmy, Kimmy, Kenny, your work. Sure. Um, sorry for speaking out of turn before. I just wanted to make sure we squeeze this in, especially if we don't get to meet over the summer. Um, which yeah. we have one more meeting. So at the last meeting, we decided as a as a body that we would make a recommendation to the board to review books against the current school district of Palm Beach County policies and no removal of books until the law goes into effect, the law being HB 1557. The rationale behind this recommendation comes as the Department of Education has not given any guidance to districts. So my question is, another piece of curriculum was pulled and I want to know what, on what grounds was this pulled and what body is currently reviewing these complaints that are, is it just up to the superintendent singularly? Is it up to the school board? Who is reviewing these items and, re and deciding to remove them from the curriculum and on what basis is the question. Can you explain what the curriculum was? We have a question. Yes, the curriculum, it was a 12th grade piece um, learning tool in the human growth and development classes. And it basically is an infographic that describes the difference between gender expression, gender identity, um, biological sex, and sexual orientation. By way of a, gen a gingerbread. By way, it, it's called the genderbread person. Yeah. So I was not involved in the decision making, but I can research more to find out what, who made the decision, what occurred. I'm not sure. I don't have all the details. That's so. I, will I guess that's my concern. <laughs> yeah. I understand. Your Lack concern. of details. I know, but I'm not going to say it on the record. So we can talk after. I just want to bring this up, I guess, to the Diversity and Equity Committee because diversity and equity are under attack. And I want to know what we as a committee can do to work with the district. This is what we're tasked to do, no? Provide insight in situations like this. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm open to discussion about this, but I think it's worth bringing up to this body. I agree especially when the law is looking at K through three and now we're looking at something that is for a senior. So our, um, according to policy, our job uh, as a DDC is to review the existing board policies and district practices to ensure that district policies and practices are inclusive. So, um, and culturally appropriate and equitable. That, that's one of our jobs. Um, identify culturally competent attitudes, behaviors, skill sets, uh, policies of an effective multicultural organization, um, identifying constraints or challenges that affect the district ability to achieve diversity, um, to ensure equitable treatment of students, families, employees, vendors, suppliers, and other community and business allies, and to provide recommendations that facilitate the prevention and elimination of such constraints or challenges. I think this fits. And you have a hand, Dr. Robinson. Ms. Madam Chair. Dr. Robinson, you're right there. And then Kimberly. Actually, I and, think Kimberly beat me. And Ms. Um, so Ms. Fishbane in the room. Um, this is on a different topic, or so are we done with that topic? We're still discussing this particular topic. Right okay. Um, I would like to be the second topic. Okay, any questions on this specific topic? I have a comment. Yes. So, like, I think this is, um, I think this is a really good and important conversation for DDEC to have. Um, so this is how I see it, and not that it's correct, but this is how I see it. Um, so, 
it's my expectation that the Department of Education is not going to give any clarity on any of this for a year, right? Um, in the meantime, the school district is left hanging in what I'm calling the gray zone, right? It's not clearly defined, but they're inviting people to complain and or sue or to whatever based on what we do. So in my opinion, we're kind of in a, a situation where we're, da we're damned if we do and damned if we don't. So I think that we, we like, quote, do the right thing as much right as we can um, with our understanding of, of the law. And I think, um, I, well, I need to go back and reread um, what was passed because I, you know, I have some understanding from what I read that other people don't share, so I need to reread it. But, but this, this is my suggestion. I made this publicly. I think it's critically important that central office, and I'm going to suggest the DDEC weighs in with central office on this, uh, makes some, some guidelines and some uh, recommendations. I, I'm gonna go closer to guidelines for district staff. One set would be how to evaluate um, the books, whether they're textbooks, classroom libraries, media center, whatever, right? In my, in my little mind, there needs to be uh, guidelines and or a rubric and to have these materials evaluated against, right? And so those guidelines or rubric need to be, and, and I think Palm Beach County is, um, I think, and, and it's really frustrating because I think we were like about to shift gears doing the right thing when all this mess came down. And so I think that we're, quote, more right than others. And so I think that we outline um, the rubric that way with our belief system in terms of affirming students and so forth. But we have to like have something written that people can evaluate against. And then maybe then we take, um, ask teachers, we've had to pay them, we'd ask teachers uh, and maybe others to evaluate these, um, these written documents against that rubric, right? So that this has been some formal evaluation against the Palm Beach County standard, right? Um, and then, uh, and then go forward. And then that way, if, if I'm a teacher and I'm using material that has been evaluated against this standard, but then in six months, some, a parent complains and DOE agrees with the parent, well, I followed the district standard. I'm, I'm quote protected, right? Like I think we have to do that for our staff and it has to be some, some central thinking around this, right? Now, this whole thing about age appropriate, ooh, that's like a humongous gray zone, right? And it's, it's a setup. It's a setup. And so, um, and I don't think it's simple. And I think that, um, that we need to be about this work expeditiously because even though the law takes effect July 1st, um, there's going to be kids who will be in summer school and I would not be surprised if some parent objects to something real or imagined, you know, before the start of the regular school year. So, I mean, I, you know, so that's, that's how I see it, it needs to happen. Um, but I, I just want to be clear that, you know, even if my position is, I understand the, um, the frustration and actually I'm going to call it the distrust with books being removed prior to July 1. But, but this evaluation needs to take place starting before July 1. Like we need to get on it, right? Because they've already shown us they're laying in wait to, to come get us, right? So, and instead of having, you know, having staff be the ones who are put at more individual risk, we need to think that through. And I would hope that DDEC would add their brain to um, to whatever this guidance would be. And so I'm, okay, I'm gonna stifle myself now. 
Um, so, yeah, I see your question, and yeah, and when is that going to get settled? And when, and then when is some guidance going to be provided? We're still, we're in a gotcha world, and and they have made it crystal clear that Palm Beach County is one of the school districts in in the, what do they call them, the hairs or, or the target or whatever they call that thing? Yeah. And so, I mean, but we need to think this through for our staff. Because, I mean, our teachers are scared, right? I mean, teachers especially, but, you know, and teacher coaches, all, everybody's scared. Like, they don't, so central office has to stand up and provide some guidance. And what I'm, the, and the reason I'm having this particular rant and ramble here is because as, when that happens, and I hope it, I hope it happens, and I hope it starts happening soon, that that even if it requires a special meeting of DDEC to review it, or maybe there's a representative from DDEC that sits at the table after the first draft or something. So I'm I'm saying all this stuff, um, Mr. Oswald, for you to hear, so you could take to your you, you guys little inner circle meetings. <laughs> Appreciate that. We we also have a hand. In here, Ms. Guthrie. All right, let me just, we got Ms. Guthrie. I just want to um, just capture what, I'll, go ahead, Ms. Guthrie, because um, I'm going to need a motion to extend time if we're going to continue, because it's 1158 at this time. Okay, yeah, yes, because I did have a, um, an item that I wanted to suggest for a future agenda. But um, I just had a clarifying I question. I'm sorry. I need a motion to extend time. It's 1158. Oh, yes, I motion to expense, extend time, five minutes. Second. It's going to take five minutes. Um, just pay attention to time. Okay, five minutes. Uh, so I had a question um, just to close up this topic. Um, so, uh, uh, Madam Chair, you read out kind of what is the requirements for the DDEC, why we, why we exist, what supports. And so just kind of coming back to Ms. Kenny's question, um, what's the process um, for consultation of the DEDEC when some of these decisions are made in terms of, you know, major decisions like removals? I mean, if we're really an, an advisory board that is advising the board and the superintendent, is there a process to engage us to get input prior to changing and making the serious decisions that impact some of the special communities that this committee is focused on? How does that happen? There is no specific process at this time. Um, I know in previous meetings I've shared because one of the um, responsibilities and the authorities that we have is reviewing policies. Well, there's a process of removing books right now with the school district. So for this particular example, if the DDC is able to review those policies that are removing books, um, if the DDC is able to remove that policy and have an equity lens on removing books or removing curriculum or book review committee, um, then we can, we have our lens in that particular process. I mean, everyone has their, we have so many different um, advisory committees and, I'm sorry, we have so many advisory committees and groups that DDEC can't be the savior, right? But it's our job to look at those policies and making sure that the book review committee, the there's another committee, um, Mr. Oswald, if, if I'm not correct, I know there's another one, but a curriculum review committee. Um, if DDEC have a member, or if there's a member from DDEC that sits on those committees, so when something occurs, we're actually reviewing, we're actually, we are, have already had our um, lens in those policies. So, in those policies. So I, 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 is there a specific policy or is there a specific policy or procedure or process when something like this happened that we say, hey, we can't do this? Well, if no, they're not. But also in the DDEC policy, there's something that says um, we cannot override the recommendations of school board, school based advisory committees. And is curriculum review not a school-based advisory committee? And that's why I constantly battle between the two and say, hey, can we take a look at those policies, those school-based advisory um, uh, councils and policies? Because we cannot override those. Uh, 
policies or parent teacher associations. Thank you. We can provide input though, can't we? We can provide input to our policies, but we cannot override the recommendations of school-based school advisory councils and parent teacher associations. And we, we also have to be mindful that there are like PTOs in our schools that are not PTAs that don't necessarily align with some of the things that the district, um, you know, that the, the district policies or other parent groups within the schools because they have their rights. So these are the things we've been advocating and fighting for for a long time. But in our policy, is that something we need to review in the district DDEC policy? But we can't override school-based school advisory um, recommendations. Thank but you. I don't think this decision was made by foot. I don't think this uh, curriculum decision was made by those committees. I think it was a higher group. Although we should probably ask staff to clarify. But, and that, that is the point, uh, I, I guess it goes back to that point because who removed it and who's the next person to review? So that process is who's the next person to review it? The book review committee, not the DEC committee. This is but only, I have input. Review committee comes, um, you know, provide, we could not override it. Am I correct, Mr. Oswald? Or, I mean, please correct me if I'm wrong based on policy. I mean, am I going anywhere with your question, Ms. Um, Guthrie? I, I think so. I mean, I, I just wanted to find out if there was a process for consultation. I'm not necessarily talking about override. I'm just mm -hmm. saying how would they, if a big decision comes before the board um, or the superintendent, is there a, you know, do we have a si si significant enough relationship where this group who is um, advising on matters of these levels of importance around equity can be consulted, can be brought in, can be heard from prior to decisions being made or even just kind of weighing in. I'm not necessarily saying that we're, over, you know, we're, we want to step into the space of overriding policies or all of that kind of formality. I'm just wondering about the consultation, if there's, if there's a relationship even with you, the chair, to say, hey, can we hear from your group your perspective on these matters, and it sounds like that's a no. So I'm, I'm satisfied with, with that. I do have a suggestion for a future agenda item, though, that is really important. So should I say that now or wait? You can absolutely. We need to extend time. It's twelve oh five. I move to extend ten minutes, and then I do have to go. <laughs> um, do I have a second? Second. Any objections? Uh, so I, I know we might not, we likely will not have time for discussion here, but given that the fact that it's um, summer, that school is closing and we're ramping up for the start of the new school year, I'd like us to really as a committee talk about school facilities. Um, um, I'm interested to find out um, some of this penny tax dollars that you know our, our taxpayers are providing to the district for the school upgrades, what schools are getting upgraded because the schools that I find myself constantly mentoring in and attending, they look like not facilities that should, that are accommodable to children's learning. So I mentor at Boynton High and we've been trying to do a beautification project for four years so that the girls' restrooms can be in working order. They don't have functional bathrooms. They don't have paint in their classrooms. The facilities are abominable. And if I know if we went to some affluent communities and looked at their schools, we would not have kids having locked bathrooms, dysfunctional spaces, no paint in classrooms. It is not appropriate to children's learning. They get their food in little baggies. I mean, I have pictures and evidence that I've been gathering this school year on that campus alone, and that's not the only one. And so what's happening with the school facility cleanups this summer and where are my tax dollars going with this penny tax? Because the schools that are in the Title I communities are oftentimes in deplorable conditions. We can discuss it because I'm gonna get on the soapbox and I can't do that today. I can't disagree. Um, we can put it for discussion for our June meeting. Um, we do have a June meeting. In I mean, I, I um, there's never enough time for for this meeting in any of these meetings. And 
we can choose to have so many subcommittees, but there's never enough time for the subcommittee meetings. And just having these meetings, and I, I say this because I don't know how else to say it. And, and it's with no grant, don't take it with a grain of salt, but we just have to do the work. We have to do the homework and we can't continue to say, um, put it on the staff and say, staff, let's have another subcommittee meeting. Let's have another subcommittee meeting. Well, when do they actually get to do the work? If we're constantly asking them. So, and this is not, this is just my, my little, I'm on my little soapbox is we got to do the work. I mean, I agree with Ms. Um, Guthrie, the schools, the horrible conditions as far as the, the eyesights, the, um, the lock, the lock locker rooms. And we talk about mental health issues. These students, this, if we talk to them, they're telling us what it looks like. This looked like a prison. This looked like, so mental health, it's all tied in. So, but when it comes to it, what are we doing outside of 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. on the fourth Thursday of every month? Are we getting our groups together? And Ms. Guthrie is, she's doing it, she's taking her pictures, but collectively as a group, what are we doing and coming to the table and say, make, sending those emails and those follow-ups? But we can't bring every, I, I ask that we all do that homework respectively in our respective agencies and not bring all of the homework and the load of work because we're, we're doing a lot of work in these meetings when it should just be updates. There's way too much work being done. So I ask that we do, you know, what are the priorities of what we want to accomplish? I know bullying, definitely um, the book ban. I saw Dr. Robinson's comment and she had to leave surrounding um, um, the spike in uh, the, the spike in numbers and going back to mass indoors. Um, I saw all, you know, I saw these things. There's a lot to unpack in two hours and it's just not going to be done. So I ask that everyone, you know, really utilize, um, I, I, I ask that we really utilize our emails, send Susan those emails, and, and I, I gotta do the same. I have a running list of items, um, recommendations, books against the current, you know, what is the district currently doing, um, DDEC review policies, additional feedback from policy 5.20, um, a running list of items that have to still come back to us. So what do we want to do in June? What do we want to discuss in June? Do we want to discuss bullying? Do we want to come back to the policy? Do we want to all do our homework based on the, the staff? I'll get with staff. If it's okay with everyone, write up this policy, really review the minutes. I can have the minutes done today. I already have half of it done. Um, send that back to everyone and say, here are my inputs from today's meeting. Here are my recommendations. Collectively, I'll collect all of that item, bring it back to us and just continue to move. But there's so much to unpack and I don't know where to start as the chair. And I don't know if staff have any input on that or if you would like to have subcommittee, like two or three more subcommittee meetings over in the month from this committee alone. I, I think that given the urgency of of the banning or removing books for analysis and given that that's opposite to our recommendations, I think we should write to the board a letter asking to explain for that, maybe with a copy to the superintendent to say, okay, this was our recommendation and, and what happens was the opposite. What's the plan now? And, and what's the plan? I think we have to focus on that law because teachers are going to start the new year with lots of self-censoring. And, and that's one of the main purposes of that law, I think. Okay. So Thank we have to fight you. it. This that should be a priority, I think. Um, and, and that, I do have a follow-up. I did send it to all board members as well. Um, but I will follow up again with another email today. Does someone want to in, um, make a motion around central office, uh, the recommendation or the suggestion um, regarding the guidelines and or rubrics for the district staff? Okay, so I, I, can I can I jump in here because we're going a lot of different rabbit holes here. Um, so first back to the gender identity and the curriculum pieces, I want to follow up with 
what occurred, why it occurred, get back to the group next time. Um, more details as to what. Um, and then I think Dr. Robinson said, in light of a lot of legislation that is very difficult to understand and very vague, if you read House Bill 7, one section you think something you can't do, and you keep reading, then you can do. So, um, it's, so if you've read the bills, I know, I mean, I think you've read them all. So a lot of them are contradictory. So it's very difficult to come. So we can tell you we're working on a plan, which we are. Do we have it all outlined? Absolutely not, because we have disagreement internally about the process, just as it's difficult to get through through here with a lack of guidance um, that is given from the state um, around understanding. So will this continue to be a conversation? Absolutely. We're trying to do the best we can um, around the challenges given um, when it comes to this with many forces leaning in, not just this committee. There are many voices that um, are pushing in to be heard in this particular space. Um, when we, my recommendation to bring back, uh, to talk about the bullying, we're talking about creating a positive and supportive call climate for students. I think bringing back the bullying and what we do and starting there provides probably the most support for students um, in the, the most immediate with these other conversations that are obviously going to continue. In so addition, we need to continue to, to pick up where we left off next meeting regarding the policy um, and recommended organizations to, so those two topics uh, for next meeting. Um, Can you repeat those topics? So you brought up around bullying, so uh, would I, so, so we're meeting June 23rd, right? And then I'm assuming July will be off. I think is this group. I think typically takes December off. July and December. Correct. So okay. So bring the bullying piece back. Bring the policy back. I'm going to unpack those organizations and prioritize those spaces. So those two pieces. Can any updates that any updates that we have at that point around our approach to addressing this curriculum. Bring back if we have anything. Um, what we have at that point. Um, and so bringing back um, bullying. What is bringing back bullying? Like, I, I mean, I think so. We so to unpacking what we do as a district. Uh, so uh, uh, when the bullying. So a presentation on bullying around um, what is in statute when it comes to um, bullying and how it's handled for and investigated, and then what we do to to work to create a positive and supportive climate. So we've already had that presentation. I mean, I, I don't know about anybody else, but we've, we've had that presentation on what bullying looks like, what we're doing at the district. I think we're going back in circles with this presentation. So, so what else are we bringing before the DEC committee? Then I'm, we did it this year? Or you done it yes, in previous we years? we did it this year. We oh, did it this year. Bullying? High school and um, I, I can tell you, we did it a couple months ago and we actually had, uh, we needed an update, but I I think was, the presentations are great. We can receive okay. a copy of the PowerPoint, but um, we need more than a presentation. Oh, we did we did positive behavior support PBS. Kimberly, go go ahead and speak. I was going to quickly say that um, our committee is going to be looking at the trainings that go to all staff on that issue, and we can report back on that. It, it may not be next month, but the month after that, mm -hmm. or the next meeting. May I quickly um, just ask if we can, I have a topic and see if it's something we wanna deal with in a future meeting, but it's kind of time sensitive and it's um, the tragedy at Dreyfus. Um, we are putting sheriff's deputies that are coming right off the street to fill the 60 vacancies. And I'm very concerned after what happened at Dreyfus, what, you know, they come with a different mindset and they're not used to dealing with children in general, especially children with disabilities and children from different backgrounds. And we're putting these people in there. Um, and since I represent one of those vulnerable populations that could get hurt, could get killed in these situations. I, I just want to express my concern about it, that the board approved to do this. And at the beginning, right after Marjorie Stoneham Douglas, they had to fill these positions 
And there were some really horrible situations, maybe not a death, but where they interfered with staff who was trying to calm a student down um, and there were lawsuits out of it. So I just am concerned about it. Um, it sounds like we have next meeting already covered, but I just want our group to have input on this and to, you know, really think about it. And if it's if it's okay, maybe um, having that conversation with staff, even some of these topics that we we can't get to in our, on, our, on an agenda topic here at this meeting, um, that if it's the will of this committee, just have allowing me me or the um, co chair Kimberly to have conversations with district staff. Um, I know we can't do it together, Kimberly, but I mean coordinating with staff and having those conversations um, separately. I have to reach out to um, the school police on a different issue and I can kind of ask them since they have a totally different training regimen, what they're doing. Um, I wish I could make it, well, I can go to a board meeting and express my concern about this. Um, so there, just so where 1421, hospital 1421 does require um, some training that just passed this when it comes to school police, well, any law enforcement work on um, a campus. So I've made the new chief in, that just started aware of that. So as we have PBSO or other municipalities, what is the process for compliance to put that on her radar prior to that takes effect July 1 around the de-escalation and these other trainings? Okay, I'm going to try to get a hold of those and review them because I'm afraid that they're not going to be sufficient when they have years of training on how to take down a perpetrator or how, you know, and also there's this fear that came out of Parkland. So it's shoot first, ask questions later, or um, Baker Act first, or restrain first without even finding out if staff is working on de escalation or really understanding the situation that they walk into a lot of times. Um, all right, so as we close this meeting uh, and come to a close with the meeting, is there any recommendation that comes to go before the board at the next board meeting? Well, we did a recommendation last time. I, I, it would be nice if it was you know, consider the one that uh, the the discussion. I mean, about I not taking the books till yeah. the review. I do have the comment that there was much discussion around reviewing books against the current school district Palm Beach County policies and not removing books in curriculum until the law goes into effect. Recently, there was a twelfth grade infographic on gender bread that was pulled with no explanation. Um, Mr. Staff, well, I'm going to put Mr. Albrook. Um, we'll look into. Um, this matter and report back to the DDEC. One comment that was made was uh, for this, or one recommendation um, that was made, or no, one comment that was made was that the central office makes some guidance, uh, guideline or, or rubric for district staff on how to evaluate the books and written documents against the Palm Beach County School District standards. Now that was a comment that was made, but was not a recommendation. That sounds good, Charmaine. This is, I mean, I don't have a recommendation because we don't have enough information about what happened here. Mm -hmm. But I think what you said and summed up in your notes is exactly correct. And I do think we, I'm not sure if we still have a quorum. Yeah. Um, we're yeah. not. Wait. Yes, we still do. Um, we still do have a quorum online as well. We're down to eight. Well, we would have to extend either way. We're going to either way, either way. I um, were. Are there any further questions to come before the board? And because we have to wrap up. Um, so I will follow can, up with Ms. Guthrie you, to see how we can address the facility piece. Can so you, for what did me. you say about um, the um, the next meeting? I've got a review of these notes and get back with you to see what's the best approach. 
Okay, and that's on the Boolean matter and the review in policy 1.0971. Yes, potentially maybe someone from operations could also potentially come to speak to just the process to prioritize facility upgrades as it relates to the penny sales tax. So, but let me talk to Mr. Sanchez about that. Okay. There is a penny sales tax um, oversight committee. I don't know if we want to send a liaison to that and find out what they're up to. Um. And just to wrap it up, perhaps I can make a recommendation that anyone that we have identified or any agencies that we've identified to come um, on the DDEC, maybe they can come and make a five-minute presentation on, at the June meeting um, prior to our policy review uh, so that they can share about their, their organization or even if they have an interest to serve on the DDEC. Um, without any further... I'm sorry? On a very positive note, next Tuesday, there's going to be an orientation for about 50 uh, possible new students for the school from Ukraine that are going to be coming to the Palm Beach County School District. So, you know, that's a devastated country, and so we're trying to help as much as we can. So we're working with a multicultural division to make sure that this will happen well. Thank you. That's awesome. That is awesome. Good news. Great way to um, close us off, Mr. Pagan. Do you want to do the honors if there's no further questions or comments to come before the committee? Motion to adjourn. Hmm. It is adjourned at 1223. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great day. So the next one is on the 23rd? Correct. Correct? Next meeting? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you all.